So welcome to my talk, Microservices and Now. My name is Sebald Wolf, I'm with InnoQ. I do consulting and training. I've written a few books. So I've written a book about continuous delivery that talks about technologies that you might use for continuous delivery. I've written a book about microservices. There is a free brochure that sums up the book. And I've written another book that talks about technologies for microservices, while the first book rather talks about architectures. And there is again a free version of that book and a lot of samples on GitHub. My colleague Hannah Prinz and me, we've written a book about service meshes, a nice infrastructure for microservices. So this talk is about what we've actually achieved with microservices. It is time to, I guess, sum up what we have achieved, why microservices are an important step forward and what we can learn from it. There is a hype cycle around microservices too. In my opinion, that started in 2011 when the term microservices was coined. And in 2015, when I wrote my book, I think it was on the height of the hype. And nowadays it's rather disillusionment and people think that microservices might not be that great after all. So if you look at such a hype cycle, the question is, why would I even care about hype cycles? And I think that's a very good question because um, it doesn't make any sense to use cool stuff it does, if it doesn't help your project. And the other way around, if you skip uncool stuff just because it's uncool but it solves your problem, that doesn't make any sense either. So in a way I would say that we shouldn't believe the hype. It is not all too important. But at the end of the day, the question is why is there even a hype? and what's sort of the core of microservices. Maybe there is something that we can learn from that and that helps us to better understand why microservices might be important or not. At the end of the day, if there is such a hype, there might be something at the core that is worth investigating and taking a closer look at. So to better understand how the whole thing started, it's interesting to look at who came up with the idea and I think the reason why this is not just interesting for historic reasons is because it also tells us what problems microservices were meant to solve and what sort of the core of the whole hype is. And I actually remember life before microservices when we used to do deployment monolith, when everything was deployed at once instead of tiny microservices. And those things could actually be get out of hand. So you might have a deployment monolith that contains lots of code, billions of lines of code that takes an hour or maybe several hours to even compile that has a very long startup time, minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes and so on. And if you have that, it means that you basically lose the ability to move forward in the project because every time you do some change, you have to compile the changes, you have to start the whole system to test it and that just takes ages in some cases. And there are complex integrations with lots of other systems because it's such a huge system, you are not able to limit yourself to the integration of just a few systems, you always have to uh, work with all the systems. And I used to do votes back then and used to ask my audience whether anyone had experienced projects where the deployment units were too large and whether anyone had experienced projects where the deployment units were too small. And it turned out that quite a few people had projects where the deployment units were too large, but not too many had projects where the deployment were, units were too small. And for that reason, I think the idea to make smaller deployment units do make some sense. So. I think there is a problem that microservices actually uh, solved and that was a problem that needed to be solved. How did the whole thing even get started? So you can take a look at Wikipedia and Wikipedia is actually a very good source about the origins of microservices. So there was a software architecture workshop and in 2011 on that workshop people realized that there was a common architectural style that they were investigating and using in their projects. And in 2012, they coined the term microservice. And in that workshop, the pioneers that pioneered that idea were Fred George, he is an independent consultant, then James Lewis from ThirdWorks, 
and Adrian Cocroft from Netflix. And I think it's interesting to look at those people because they are different, very senior people, not young people working at some hip startup, but people who have seen uh, their share of projects, of architectures, and were trying to find new ways to build their systems. They had significant projects. So if you look at Netflix, for example, that's a project that uh, basically turned over the whole company and made it look different before it was sending around DVDs. Afterwards, it was doing online video. So it's a very important project. The same is true for the other projects. They solved some similar problems. So for example, they had scalability issues. They wanted to have a lot of people working on the project, maybe also a lot of load in some cases, but they also had some specific problems. So Netflix had a strategy around the cloud, so that needed to be solved. And if you listen to what James Lewis said at that time, it's actually a lot of very different, very demanding functional requirements that he had. It turned out that even at the beginning, they were using rather diverse technologies. So Fred George, for example, advocated asynchronous communication. Netflix is based on synchronous communication. Netflix uses rather large microservices that could keep a whole team busy. Fred George rather advocates very small microservices. So even though they all agreed on the term microservice, it was already very different things that were, they were thinking about and similar but not identical problems. So there was never such a clear microservices concept where you would say, yes, this is the definition, this is what microservices is all about, this is it. Uh, so that's a takeaway. And I think if you look at the situation nowadays, lots of people understand very different things under the term microservice. So it is still the same. It's still the case that people are, well, uh, thinking about different things if they hear that term microservice. Also, microservices started as a solution to very real problems. So those people were just trying to solve their problem in their projects and they came up with this idea. So it wasn't about some hype, it wasn't about some tool vendor inventing new interesting ideas. It was a very real solution to very real problems. And that is also why it's interesting to look at all the experiences that we have and learn from that and take the next step forward because it is something that was meant to solve real problems. So there are different areas that you might want to look at. First of all, there are modules. Microservices, in my opinion, are just a different type of module. And for that reason, it's interesting to, to look at the definition of modules, what they are and how you work with them. So let's do that. Um, if you have a deployment monolith, if everything is deployed at once, the modules are in that deployment monolith and you would come up with some architecture. So in this case, there is one module and it's supposed to be used by different other modules and that's it. So this is the desired architecture. This is how things should work together. Now, if you put that all in the deployment monolith, my experience is that dependencies will sneak in and eventually everything will be connected to everything. The reason for that is if you have those modules maybe Java packages, for example, and you sit at your code and you do some coding, then you don't actually see those modules and you don't actually see those dependencies, but instead you just see a, a huge pile of code. And now you start to write some code and you introduce some dependency to some class somewhere. And all of a sudden you have dependencies that weren't desired that shouldn't be there and you continue to do that and you continue to do that and after a while the whole deployment monolith is a huge mess. And I, I've seen enough deployment monolith and I've reviewed enough deployment monolith to believe that this is the typical case. If you don't take any measurements to solve that problem then you will end up with a rather chaotic architecture. With microservices it's different because those boundaries are actually process and network boundaries. So there is an interface like a REST interface, and if you write some code and you want to use 
a REST interface of some microservice, you will have to write a significant portion of code. So it's unlikely that some dependency just sneaks in just like that. That's not going to happen. Of course, this is not enough to justify uh, using microservices. There are other means to do that. So you can use architecture management tools to achieve the very same thing, but it is an advantage that you have if you use microservices. So if you have those modules in your system and you implement them as microservices, then you have these strong boundaries between the modules. It's boundaries between processes, REST interfaces, these kinds of things. And also the modules are not just for developers. So if you ask some operations person about a deployment monolith, he or she will say, well, that's just one huge process and I don't see how that is structured internally. With microservices, it's different. With microservices, those modules are also visible to operations people and also, for example, you can investigate the communication if you look at the network layer because they talk to each other through the network and so on and so on. I'm not saying that's an advantage, it's just a difference. And for that reason, the modules become more obvious. They are also obvious to operations people and other people. They are harder to change and therefore it's harder for dependencies to sneak in. And what I like about the whole thing is that the discussion around modules becomes very important again. So we are having discussions around modules because I believe at least because we started using microservices and now you can have talks about modules and modulization because people realize that there is a challenge and microservices actually put that into the uh, spotlight. And that is why uh, there is this idea of modular monoliths. So let's talk about modular monoliths. Actually, monoliths have very different definitions. So first of all, there is the architecture monolith and an architecture monolith has no structure. So it doesn't have any modules that you can uh, see if you look at it. So it's a huge architectural mess and it is something that you don't want to do. Uh, on the other hand, there are deployment monoliths and that is just one system where everything is deployed at once. And they might have modules, internal modules, and they might have some internal structure. I would actually argue that deployment monolith should have modules because modules are key to even build complex systems. If I have a module, I can understand it on its own. So it's easier for me to understand a part of the code. And then there is the interaction between the modules. That's the other thing that I need to understand. So I just need to understand less about the system to do anything sensible. I either need to understand one module in detail or how modules interact, but I don't need to understand everything at a very detailed level. So that is key to build very complex systems. And it shouldn't be surprising then that if you have a deployment monolith, you should have modules. So I would argue that the microservices type is already well, worthwhile, so to say, if it helps people to understand modules. However, we should ask the question, why are so many deployment monoliths badly structured and how are we going to solve that? So I would think if you have all those deployment monoliths and they do have architectural issues, then you have to have some way to, well, deal with that and to improve that situation. That doesn't necessarily mean that we should use microservices. You can also use some architecture management tool or some other means to achieve that. But at least we are having that discussion. And I think that's very, very important. And I think it is something that the microservices discussion basically started. I would argue if I look at architecture, the idea of architecture to me is that you have to find some technical solution for some problem, usually a business problem. That's the goal. And if you have microservices, that's just one tool to achieve some things like we talked about scalability, scalability of the development organization, for example. So if that is a goal, then microservices might be a tool, but it's just one part of the solution. So for example, if you are aiming for a very user-friendly system, then microservices won't solve the problem. So you have to look at other solutions and they are 
neither microservices nor a deployment monolith. So I'm not sure why you would exclude microservices upfront because it basically means it's one tool less that you might use. And on the other hand, if you do use microservices, I would urge you to understand why you're doing that and to find some reasons. So I'm not really happy if I go to some projects and they say, well, we are using microservices. And if I ask for the reasoning, they say, well, this is just how things are done around here or how we believe things are done in our industry, because you should have a specific solution for the problem that you are facing. And you should have some reason to use microservices in that specific case. So, so much for the impact of microservices on basic architectural questions. Now, there are other things, domain-driven design, for example. When I started looking at domain-driven design, that was around 2005, to me, it looked like a paradigm for object-oriented programming. So finally, I could take the features of an object-oriented programming language, such as classes, and I could say this class will be a repository, this will be a service, this will be an entity, this will be an aggregate. So there is sort of a blueprint how to build object-oriented systems. So it's a rather fine-grained approach. So this is why I use the pencil as a metaphor. It is something where you do the detailed work. You have a large system. It has lots of classes, thousands of classes, possibly it's a, if it's a large system. And we talk about each of these small classes, how they should, what they should look like. I did do a workshop with Eric Evans by that time. And he started off by talking about the coarse grained parts of domain driven design, which I found very interesting already back then. And nowadays in 2020, it's actually very different. If I talk about domain driven design nowadays, or if people talk about domain driven design nowadays, they are actually talking about coarse grain modules, rather large modules and things like bounded context, where each bounded context has a separate domain model, strategic design, where we talk about how those bounded contexts would interact with one another, and things like core domain or generic subdomain, where we are talking about which parts of the system are important from a business perspective and which parts of the system are really not that important from a business perspective. And that is where you use this large brush to have those coarse grained uh, architectural elements. So the impact of microservices on architecture is basically that we start talking about modules again, which I think is great. We talk about domain-driven design and we talk about coarse-grained domain-driven design. We talk about coarse-grained decoupling. And I think that's great because in a lot of clients, I see the problem that they have a large data model. It's very complex. It's often in the database. And then they have a hard time to build anything sensible on top of that. And this idea of domain-driven design, to have bounded context, to have individual smaller data models, that is how you can tackle the problem of these large gigantic databases that have all the data about all the things in the business. Microservices are a new type of modules. So they have separate deployment, for example. So it's a fundamental change. But as I said before, just like any other architecture option, it's just one option that you have in building your system. And obviously, there are lots of other options too. So what about the long-term architecture? Well, first of all, I would argue that maybe we have other long-term problems. So if you look at the global temperature, and if we look at the next few decades, we are here right now. And uh, if we continue to do what we are doing right now, we will end up in a completely different world. And I guess software and long-term architecture of software systems isn't really our problem by that time anymore. But let's assume that we solve that problem and that the climate catastrophe somehow is uh, contained and that we do have some solutions for that. Then we have problems around the long-term architecture of software systems because many systems survive actually quite long decades, 20 years, 30 years. And if I look at people who are doing architecture right now, 
they're basically saying, okay, here's my very clean architecture. This is what the system should look like. And we are going to enforce that. And we are going to make sure that we, are going, that we won't have any architecture rot. So this is our idea. This is how we are going to implement it. And it will be stable for a long time. And I have to admit that I'm not sure because if I look at all the systems, I wonder where are the systems that have successfully implemented a clean architecture, have maintained it for a long time and are still maintainable. And how do you even enforce such an architecture? So of course there are architecture management tools, but with self-organization you actually want to have people coming up with new ideas and somehow incorporate them. So there has to be some long-term stable thing in your system, but it's rather hard to come up with an idea what that should really look like. Oftentimes when I talk about long-term architecture, people say, well, you know, um, there are those things that will change and they change frequently. So that's one part of the uh, problem and we have to be flexible around that. That basically means that uh, there are some decisions that we are making now that will survive very long. But to understand which of those decisions are the ones that will survive very long, we have to predict the future and that's hard. So there is an architecture tool that you can use for that, uh, a crystal ball to predict the future and to see what the future will bring. But so far, uh, I have to admit that there is a lack of reliability there. So maybe it's not really possible to predict the future. What I'm trying to say here is, if someone says, well, this is something where we have frequent changes, it basically means it is something where we expect frequent changes or we had where we had frequent changes in the past. I wouldn't be surprised if most of the problems that we have in our architecture are actually from changes that we didn't predict. Because if we do have changes that we predicted, we can adjust to that and we can have some plan how to deal with that. But if it's something that changes and people haven't predicted that, then that's much harder to come up with a good idea how to tackle that. And uh, certainly there wasn't anyone in the original architecture thinking about that. So that's somehow hard to come up with a long-term strategy for an architecture just by predicting what will change. I would argue that microservices actually have a different approach. So if you look at the structure, there are the bounded context and domain-driven design that we were talking about and they capture the essence of the business. So if I look at some e-commerce, for example, there is a fulfillment, there is payment, there is order intake, these kinds of things. Those might be bounded context and the split into those bounded contexts is pretty much stable. I would believe that even before the internet, even before mail order, those are very basic building blocks that have been around for very, very long. So probably they will be the same in the next few years or even in the long term. And also if that stuff really changes, so if all of a sudden you don't have payments in e-commerce anymore, or if you don't have fulfillment, or if you have very fundamental changes in fulfillment or payment or whatever, then probably the architecture is not your only problem and probably not the worst problem. Building your system around those domain abstractions might be a good idea to have an architecture that survives in the long term. However, that's just the split into bounded context. And it doesn't talk about technologies. So with technologies, there is a different problem. If I have some fancy technology right now, that will be outdated sooner or later. So if I use some JavaScript framework, there will be a new version in a few weeks. If I use some Java framework, there will probably be a new version in some years. And sooner or later, there will be new versions and only those versions will get security fixes. So then you have to act and you need to be up to date, at least for the security uh, fixes. And you might be facing a large risky technology update. So I've seen projects that were just trying to migrate a system from some old Java E standard to a new Java E standard and they spent considerable time doing so and considerable effort doing so. So how are we going to solve that? Are there any other examples for successful long-term architecture? 
And if you look outside IT, there are modular synthesizers and they have a standard for communication. So for controlling the pitch of some note and for triggering that some note should be played. And the other thing that they standardize is deployment. So they say, this is the size of a module. This is how uh, it should get uh, power. And that's pretty much it. So that's the standard. And then you can wire them together and have nice customized individual uh, synthesizers and you can have several modules that are somehow wired together and uh, create some sound. This standard is around for almost 25 years. There are more than 5,000 modules nowadays and it's actually very, very different modules, sometimes using technologies that haven't been invented when the standard was originally created. I would argue that microservices have a similar idea. So you would standardize communication. You would say, okay, we are going to use REST, we are going to use messages, whatever. And you would standardize deployment. You would say what you need to deploy is a container. And probably you would also define an operations interface for monitoring, for logging and so on. But you would hide the internal technologies. So it's up to other people to decide whether you're going to use Java or Go, or Go and you can have different technologies in each microservice. So that's basically information hiding on the next level. You hide the information which programming language, which technology stack is being used. And that allows you to use heterogeneous technology stacks where each microservice has a different technology stack. And that means that updates to new technologies are easier because you can just migrate stepwise. You can change each microservice and that means that you mitigate the risk because you're not doing this big bang change. And I'm not sure how you can achieve that in a different way to have the flexibility to use different technologies to update just one module with a new technology and so on. But I'm biased. I've written a few books about microservices. So of course, it seems to me that this is the solution. So concerning long-term architecture, there are two things. Domain-driven design gives us this stable coarse grain split around bounded context. That's at least, at least what I believe it gives us. It is hard to avoid architecture rot with other measures. And I don't think that the idea to just rely on a clean architecture is such a great idea because eventually you will probably end up with architecture rot again anyway. So I would rather plan for heterogeneous technologies where each microservice might be implemented in a different technology. And I'm not sure whether there are alternatives despite microservices for, do for doing that. What else is there? Well, continuous delivery. So if you talk about continuous delivery, it's interesting to look at uh, the DevOps study and to look at the Accelerate book. And what they basically say is there are elite performers and low performers. And the difference between the two is that the elite performers deploy multiple day times per day on demand, while the low performers deploy once per month or once every six months. That changes a little bit. So the study is based on surveys and every year different people answer the survey. So that is why uh, some, in some years the low performers deploy more frequently than in other years. It's just random fluctuation between the different audiences of the survey. The survey also asks about the consequences of continuous delivery. There are some things that are easy to figure out. So you would probably predict that if you deploy more frequently, uh, the lead time for changes is actually better. The change would go into production sooner. There is better time to restore services because you do a new deployment. And if you do a new deployment, you're basically rebuilding the service in a new version. So if some service fails, it's easier for you to recreate that service because you are used to recreating that service in a new version. It has a better change failure rate. So if you change more frequently, it's less stuff that you actually change and therefore it's less likely that it fails. One thing that is actually surprising is, so would you be more productive if you deploy more frequently? Well, you do need to invest some time in creating the continuous delivery pipeline. So it's not that obvious. Maybe it would 
mean that you invest more time on the continuous delivery pipeline and therefore you less spend less time on your work. It turns out quite the opposite is true. So if you do continuous delivery and you deploy on demand, you spend a lot more time on new things. And that is also why I think the term elite performers, just because you deploy multiple times per day, is justified because you are doing more work on your features, for example. You do less work on security issues, on bugs, end user support, and these kinds of things. And also there is less burnout, more psychological safety, and so on. And those are things that you probably wouldn't predict. Uh, and that is why this book and the study are so important, because they basically argue if you do continuous deployment, it has a lot of advantages. So there is a customer scenario where I did some consulting and they had quarterly releases. They had 10 weeks of testing, two days of release or over the weekend. So that means they spent lots of time on testing and releases. And the goal was to deploy several deployments per day. And I think that's a very good goal because it means that you become an elite performer. For that reason, I thought it was a great thing to do some consulting there. And if you do that, then you have a very, very tiny um, amount of time for doing the testing, the releases and the development. So how can you do that? How can you become an elite performer? So first of all, deployment and testing would rather become two things that happen in parallel. And now let's assume that for the testing, we get uh, a 100 fold increase in speed because we do some automation. 10 weeks of testing, five days per week, eight hours per day, 400 hours times 100. That means four hour tests. I'm not saying that this is easy to achieve. It's rather sort of the maximum that you could achieve. Then we have the releases. So let's assume that we get a four time speed up there, which means instead of uh, two days, you get two hours. And if we sum that up, if we have two hours of deployment plus four hours of tests. It's six hours. So it's one deployment per day. A little bit more than one deployment per day. So you would need a, at least another three foot in, uh, improvement or maybe four times faster to be able to do multiple deployments per day. I would argue that the only way to re really achieve that is to do to have independently deployable modules, which are basically microservices to me, and I'm not sure whether there are any other uh, solutions. So continuous delivery gives lots of benefits, as we've seen. Microservices solve that problem that you have this large thing that needs to be deployed at once. And therefore, it is one tool to solve those continuous delivery challenges. And I would definitely consider them. I'm not saying that you should implement them. I'm just saying it is something that you should consider. And I would argue that continuous delivery is one of the important reasons for doing microservices. What else is there? If you look at the culture and the organization, then uh, microservices basically made the Conway's law famous again. So what Conway's law says is that the architecture copies the communication structure of your project. So if we have an e-commerce shop and we have a team for UI, a team for backend and a team for the database, then we would also have these three modules in our system. And if there is some change, like changing the order process, that will probably mean that we need to change the UI because different data is, needs to be input. Uh, then we have the backend where the logic will be changed and we are probably need to store different data. So if it would mean that all of the modules would be changed. And it also means that all teams would be influenced by that change. And that means if you look at the time, it will take three sprints, one sprint of each team. So if there is some delay, it will propagate to the other team. So it's also more risky. Now, what microservices say is that you can have this inverse convey maneuver. It means that you let the architecture drive the organization. So you would design the bonded context and then you would have one team for each bonded context. That's basically the idea. And 
if you do that, if you have those microservices, and if you have each microservice uh, one bounded context, then you would have a separation on the domain logic part. So there are stories for billing, for example, and they go to the billing team and they go to that one bounded context concerned with billing. And then there is the microservice that implements the bounded context and technical coordination and deployment is just for that microservice. So that team could decide which technology to use in that microservice and that team could decide when to deploy that microservice. And the same is true for search and order, for example. So you can actually support independent teams in that way. However, you need to trust your teams to make the right decisions concerning technology, for example. And that is where uh, you need to, to think about your culture and to make sure that your culture actually supports that. So this, this idea to deal more with the culture and the organization is something that microservices made popular again. Microservices allow for more independence. However, you should not focus on tools or technologies, but you should rather focus on developers and tools. So again, microservices are just another great tool. It's not gonna be the solution to everything and you shouldn't enforce it on your team. So in conclusion, I would argue that microservices are a hype or were a hype and um, I wouldn't listen too much to hypes. I would rather try to figure out what the solution to my architecture problem at hand is. However, it gave us a renaissance of modules and domain driven design. So that's great. And those are fundamental things that do improve architecture very fundamentally. So I think that's really, really good. We have a different approach towards long-term architecture using microservices. So that's also great. It's just another tool that we can add to our toolbox. It helps with continuous delivery, which again has a lot of benefits. It established the organization as a tool for architecture. So that's also great. And those are the reasons why I think microservices added something to the discussion. Even if you don't do microservices, you're profiting from that discussion. It still started some ideas that you can use even if you don't use microservices. For example, the stronger focus on modularization, domain driven design, coarse grained decoupling, these kinds of things. And even if you do microservices, we will have those old systems around for quite a long time. So I think we shouldn't ask too much whether we should use microservices or not, but rather we should look at um, how they, they collaborate, how we integrate them. And what I see most often at clients are hybrid architectures where microservices and deployment monolith coexist and you have both approaches in your system at specific parts of your system. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot for the attention and I hope you enjoyed the talk.